This is CBC Here and Now. A hiking trip goes terribly wrong in Grossmorn. The momentum kept picking up and it was either like the cliff or the rock. And I was like, but I'm breaking, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. I'm breaking my leg. One man loses his home. A community loses its history. And dear Lord, I dropped everything and run. And when I went downstairs, oh, she was all on fire. Flipping the switch on the Muskrat Falls inquiry. I would fully expect that we would hear from, from Mr. Martin, certainly, and I also expect that we would hear from Mr. Williams. It all begins on Friday. Everything but the kitchen sink in the mix over the next 24 hours. Snow, ice pellets, freezing rain, rain, double digit temperatures, even, bit of, even a bit of sun. The full details are coming up. Our top story tonight is one of survival. Two university students spent a night on the side of Gross Morn Mountain after a harrowing accident. Yeah, the couple was snowshoeing on the popular West Coast Trail during the long weekend when something went horribly wrong. Here now's Jeremy Eaton has been following this story and joins us live from the newsroom. So Jeremy, walk us through what happened. Debbie, it's an incredible story. So Haley Oblinas and Colin Smith were spending their Easter Sunday on Grossmorn Mountain. Now the two are originally from New Brunswick, but are living in St. John's going to Memorial University. So after hearing all the good things about that popular hiking trail, they decided to tackle it. And when they got to the summit, they celebrated with a beer and a few peanut butter sandwiches. But on the way back down, things took a terrible turn. On our way down, uh, it was really steep and uh, icy, and um, the snowshoe, the picks just wouldn't dig into the snow, and I just slipped, and um, slid. yeah, slid for like <laughs> a good ways, and the momentum kept picking up, and it was either like the cliff or the rock, and I was like, screw it, I'm no, breaking, okay. <laughs> it's okay, it's I'm okay. breaking my leg, and um, so you knew, like, either you were going to fall off the cliff, and I, like I, didn't, I couldn't see what was. You didn't know on for that. sure what would happen if yeah. you went down that way. Yeah. And um, yeah, I could just hear Colin yelling my name, and um, yeah, so I hit the rock, and right after, I'm like, I broke my leg, I broke my leg, and um, I was so scared. Like, I knew I needed, I knew I didn't hit my head. Um, I was so conscious still, and so I just pulled out my phone and hope to God that I had cell service. And I did, and called 911. And then looked for Colin to make sure he knew I was alive. I found her propped up, and seated in a very good position, actually. Uh, luckily enough, she landed the way she did. Yeah. And she told me right away, uh, hey, I just called 911. Uh, my leg's broken. I don't think I can move it. And at that point, I could tell that she was immobile. Her uh, leg had swollen up quite a bit. And uh, after that, I called 911 as well, and I was just on the phone with operators and search and rescue all night. The, the operator asked me if I could do uh, if I could do any uh, first aid check, and uh, uh, when she told me she broke her leg and where the uh, leg was swelling up a lot was at her upper thigh. I knew with uh, I knew femur breaks are pretty they're very serious, and that you could hit arteries and stuff. So I couldn't really do much with her splash pants because they're so they had that elastic band around the waist that's really tight. So I didn't want to move her as little as I could so I just trying to check around her hips for any pooling of blood or anything like that they told me to check for and then other than that um, I just told her to stay conscious keep your eyes open asked her how she was doing and um, we just kept on the phone all night with operators and we were both 100% shock mm -hmm. um, I think I was really concerned about the leg I think it really hit us when we started getting cold that like we need to be rescued. It was a little easier when we still had daylight and mm. uh, we had really good visibility up there up until from about 6 to about 9.45 I'd say. So the cormorant was en route and uh, we got a call and it was just about when night fell and it was starting to get dark and I could kind of see this cloud r rolling in and um, they said they were, we got a call that they were 30 minutes out and uh, that's when the storm kind of picked up a bit, started snowing, and conditions just went from very good to uh, very poor in a short amount of time. And I think the biggest thing that we thought was kind of a tease was just hearing the hearing the, the helicopter all night, but 
we were thankful that they knew where we were, so. Did you ever feel hopeless? There are definitely yeah, times where I was like to call and like, what do we do? What are we gonna do? And he'd say like, Haley, we just wait, like they're gonna find us. Cause they were so good. Like they'd give us a call. There was no hour that passed up by or by that we didn't hear from, from someone like Our whether team. it be, yeah, the people in the helicopter or, um, Search and, search and rescue like we'd always be in contact with them which was so reassuring to know that they're not gonna stop until they find us um, it was two uh, Sartex and two parks crew that came up the, the first crew that came up and just seeing the lights come up the mountain and through, through the storm and them yeah we them yelling to us and us yelling back they still had to take their time obviously to get to us because it was a very steep slope but we were just so relieved to finally and they came Here's so somebody. fast. They like did. That's, that's the fastest thing. thing. You're saying it's five hours down, and they're up in three hours. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know the mountain, that's still a four-kilometer hike just to get to the base. And we were at a very, like, we were the steepest part of that peak in the bowl of that mountain. And what did they bring other than hope? <laughs> they had a huge sleeping bag that I was in for the remainder of the time. They like, stabilized her right away. They yeah. just worked on her right away as soon as they got there. Made sure we were warm. That's the first thing they did and on like a flat surface. Mm -hmm. they moved us a little bit as much mm -hmm. as they could. And I think at that point, both Colin and I just like slept in our, like when we were warm, we just slept. I think for a little bit, that, yeah. Until sunrise, because they couldn't move until sunrise. So then you get, I guess you get airlifted, you get hauled up into the chopper, do you remember that? That was the most, uh, being in the helicopter, like in, with heat shooting at my face and like that was the first time I actually got out of my sleeping bag and saw what was going on and saw the people that rescued me or some of the people because there were so many. Mm -hmm. And that was just like I knew we were safe then, like I knew we were when they first came but just being warm mm -hmm. having a little bit of warmth I don't know that was the best and how did you feel when you got to see the faces of the people who had spent the night with you and it would help you get out of this terrible situation that you're in it's like so, so grateful great. like everyone that helped and with such like urgency and they never gave up on us <laughs> I just wanted like it was so like we're so blessed <laughs> Like, they were so helpful. I couldn't have asked for better people. So the couple is recuperating in the Health Science Center across the street here from where we are at the CBC. And they said one of the reasons they wanted to speak to us is because they wanted to thank all the volunteers and rescuers who spent the night trying to make sure that they would get off that mountain. Oblenis says she'll be in hospital for a few more days, but uh, she says that she should be fine and that her mom is on her way to come visit her, so that'll make her feel a little bit better. Now, when asked if they're going to hike Gross Moor Mountain again, they say that the second attempt will not be in the winter. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in the newsroom. The town of Paradise is in hot water once again with the province's privacy commissioner. In just over five months, there have been six investigations conducted by the privacy commissioner. This time, an investigation into security cameras has produced a stern recommendation. Turn the cameras off. Here and Now's Ryan Cook reports. We are here at the Paradise Town Hall where all of our movements are surely being tracked by these surveillance cameras you see here behind us. And that seems pretty reasonable given that this is a public building, right? Well, it turns out there's actually legislation that says public bodies must show they need surveillance cameras. And Privacy Commissioner Donovan Malloy says Paradise has not done that yet. Malloy investigated a complaint about the cameras and released his report yesterday. He can't speak to the specifics of the case since the town has not yet responded, but he can say this. You just can't put video surveillance everywhere because it's convenient. You have to have a reason, and I'm talking now about public bodies. If you're going to do it, you have to comply with the requirements in the Act. The town says it installed 87 cameras around its buildings after vandalism, false fire alarms and bomb threats. 18 of those cameras are in staff-only areas. Malloy asked for more information on those incidents, but he says he never heard back, and thus he's recommended they shut the cameras off. But as for residents of Paradise, well, they don't seem too concerned. When you know that there's that sense of 
security, like you're being watched for people that are essentially going to steal or rob you, whatever it may be, like you feel safe and secure because you know that someone else is watching that. I say let the cameras roll. I have them all over my house. And uh, if you got nothing to hide, if you're not doing anything wrong, what are you worried about? But Malloy says that's a bad argument since we are all entitled to our privacy. It's sort of like saying, you know, I don't care about the freedom of speech because I have nothing to say. Town officials now have 10 days to respond to the recommendations. They declined comment today but said they do intend to meet that deadline. But if they don't, they can be taken to court. Ryan Cook, CBC News, Paradise. To St. John's now, where city workers hope to have a water main break repaired by 8 o'clock tonight. This was the mess first thing this morning, facing people who live at the Kingsgate condominiums. A large underground water pipe burst behind the Sobeys grocery store on Mary Meeting Road. That sent a massive amount of water spilling down the street and onto the property. It is a 16-inch water main, so it is larger than your local mains that are typically found in residential streets. It's more of a transmission main. So uh, with the uh, quantities of water that came out of the water main this morning, there were some, um, uh, a lot of water over land on the streets and uh, the fields around this area. Well, to the Northern Peninsula now. Author Earl Pilgrim has lived in his Roddickton home for 50 years. When smoke started billowing up from his basement over the weekend, it was only a matter of minutes before decades of books and documents went up in flames. Here now is Colleen Connors traveled to the Northern Peninsula, where Pilgrim is looking back on all the history lost in that fire. Scorched pages amongst the rubble. All that's left of Earl Pilgrim's makeshift museum of Northern Peninsula history. I had uh, 15 albums and everything was in that and, and slides. I had reel to reel tapes of way back people. I mean, and I had records that Dr. Grinfell had. And, and God only knows what stuff I had collected in that house. Pilgrim tossed garbage and some debris in his wood furnace Saturday afternoon, cleaning up after a renovation. When I all the poker out, when I shoved it in, but that I took the poker out, and you know, you like you see, there could be a bit of smoke on it or something that you shake it, and mm -hmm. then I hung it up near the near the wall and and right over the the wood box. Minutes later, the wall was on fire and smoke filled the house. Pilgrim got out safely and firefighters arrived within minutes, but live wires stopped them from going inside and the house burned black. Everything is gone. All the manuscripts, I had several manuscripts uh, that I was going to uh, put out now in books. Because, see, I write everything out in, in freehand, in ledgers, see? And, uh, and, of course, all of that went, everything. Pilgrims lost thousands of books, including dozens he wrote. Also gone, 50 years of memories that he shared with his late wife Beatrice. But the loss goes beyond that. Roddickton's mayor says the entire town is affected by this documented history being destroyed. For now, Pilgrim says he'll stay with his sister in Roddickton. His immediate plans? Unknown. But he still says he'll continue to write. As for if he'll rebuild, if he does, it'll have to be on his own. He didn't have insurance. Pilgrim, of course, regrets not having insurance on his home, but says many people living in this rural area do not have house insurance. Pilgrim also says that yes, insurance would have helped bring back a property, but it would never restore all of the documents, writing, and treasures that he has lost in this fire. Colleen Connors, CBC News. Roddickton. The Legal Aid Commission is responding to criticism that its lawyers aren't real lawyers. The comment was made yesterday by a man who fired the legal aid lawyer who was representing him. As here now's Glenn Payette reports, the director of legal aid says there needs to be a change in the perception of the office. Accused sex offender Adam Olford had some harsh things to say at provincial court in St. John's yesterday when he fired his legal aid lawyer. I found that legal aid was not doing enough for me, and I wanted to get a real lawyer, not one that's working for the government. Some people haven't figured out that 
Legal aid lawyers are exactly the same as a private lawyer in training, in experience, and in their commitment to their clients. Summers says it saddens him that some people don't think legal aid lawyers are as good as lawyers in private practice. He says legal aid lawyers and those in private practice go to the same law schools and have to pass the same bar exams to qualify. We attract some very top quality people to work for us, partly because we pay well and regularly, <laughs> uh, and partly because it's a place for those who have a commitment to help the public want to come and work. It's, it's a chance to help the people who can't afford to hire private lawyers. Summer says what he sees as unfair criticism of legal aid can be tough on morale. You've helped somebody, uh, you've, done, you've done the extra mile to help them get what you, they need to get, and then they turn around and they say something like, my goodness, you're almost good enough to be a real lawyer. Uh, <laughs> it kind of, it's, it's just that little bit of discouragement. They think because they're not paying for the service, it's not as good as if they did. Summer says Legal Aid will be working on a campaign to educate the public about the skills and training of its lawyers. The fact is our lawyers want to be known as lawyers, not Legal Aid lawyers. Uh, they want to be appreciated for the work they do and not who they work for. Summers says he's even run into people who think legal aid is staffed by law students. He points out that some of the lawyers here have decades of experience. Glenn Pay at CBC News, St. John's. Now the comments you heard there from Adam Olford came after he approached a private lawyer, Bob Buckingham, in the hallways in court yesterday. Olford said he was concerned about how legal aid was handling his case. Olford says Buckingham suggested that he get his matter postponed and hire a different lawyer. Summers says legal aid is now looking into Buckingham's role in all of this. All I can say at this point is we're looking at all the possible options. Uh, we will be responding but exactly how and when is, I can't really comment on. If the Churchill River starts to rise, there's a new warning system in place. It's in the
people living in Mud Lake and the lower valley of Happy Valley Goose Bay are on edge heading into this spring. Last year, a flood forced many to evacuate their homes in the middle of the night with little or no warning. As the snow begins to melt this year, everyone is watching the river, including government agencies. Here now is Jacob Barker to look a look at some of the improvements that authorities have made along the river in anticipation of this year's melt. All eyes are on the Churchill River this year as we head into spring. Last year, water levels began rising and rising until it looked like this. Dozens of people were evacuated in the early hours of a May morning, some with water washing into their homes. Have you ever yeah. seen anything like this? I remember I saw it. No. <laughs> okay, never this high before. Never this high before, no. On paper, the flood looked like this. A gradual rise in levels and a spike when the flood occurred and the people scrambled to get out. The government says with the system they've put in place since then, they'd know well ahead of time if trouble was on the way. This should definitely give you at least 12 hours to 24 hours warning that something is potentially going to happen. Seven new water monitoring stations have been installed. Three more are on the way. Satellite imagery shows the movement of ice on the river, and if it's clogged anywhere, helicopters give a reading of just how thick the ice is using ground-penetrating radar. It's an incredible system that brings uh, many pieces of technology, many pieces of uh, local knowledge together um, in a way that is truly incredible. About a dozen sets of eyes will keep watch on the data, which is also available online to anyone who wants to look at it but others will have their eyes on the river itself. We go out and have a look and just, you know, try to match up what we're seeing on the webpage to what we're seeing on the ground. If the water levels do rise to a worrisome level, an alert will be issued. While it's not gonna, going to stop a flood from happening if the conditions are right, but it will give us a 36 to 48 hour window so that we can respond. You can't stop the flood, but you can be better prepared. And this year, with all these eyes on the river, the hope is that's the case. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. While many will be watching water levels on the Churchill River, many will also be watching the inquiry into the Muskrat Falls project, which will begin this Friday. The Ball government initiated the inquiry as the mega project's budget ballooned to nearly $13 billion, double the original cost estimates. Commissioner Justice Richard LeBlanc is not doing any interviews, but I did speak with inquiry co-counsel Kate O'Brien this afternoon. Well, Kate O'Brien, thank you very much for meeting me here. This is where the inquiry is going to be held. Things get underway on Friday. What exactly will happen then? On Friday, we're going to have our applications for standing and funding. So parties have already applied actually in writing to the commissioner. We've had approximately 20 applications. On Friday, everybody will be heard here in this room. Most of them will come and appear in person, but others will be attending by telephone. Looking ahead to what the inquiry is going to be guided by, what are the terms of reference? There are four main terms of reference. So the first one really has to do with NALCOR's uh, recommendation to government to sanction the Muskrat Falls project. So what options did NALCOR con did consider? What work did it do to lead it to recommend sanction of the project? The second one uh, that uh, we'll be looking at really has to do with the cost overruns, why they happened. The third uh, term of reference that we're looking into really has to do with the p exemption of the PUB. So the Public Utilities Board, um, this project was exempted from their oversight. We'll be looking at the effect that that exemption has had on the project development, the project costs. And the fourth term of reference, and the final one, really has to do with government's oversight of the project. So government's role in, in making, making the sanctioning decision and also government's oversight at, of the project as it has been constructed. And and that will really be looking at what government knew when, did government have the appropriate information and did they reasonably consider it. So Kate, what won't the inquiry be able to look at? So absolutely, the Commissioner will not be making any recommendations, recommendations or findings that relate to any criminal liability or civil liability. The Commissioner will not be looking into the federal government's involvement in decisions to provide the federal loan guarantees. While the Commissioner will be looking at whether certainly environmental risks were considered, 
and how they were considered. He will not be diving into a consideration of those environmental risks themselves, like he won't be determining, uh, you know, whether there is an environmental risk or whether there is not environmental risk. And um, uh, he also won't be going into any areas where there's any active litigation. Are we going to hear from people like the former Premier, Danny Williams, the former CEO of Nalcor, Ed Martin? So we haven't come up with our definite uh, uh, witness list yet, but uh, I would fully expect that we would hear from, from Mr. Martin, certainly, and I also expect that we would hear from Mr. Williams. Uh, those uh, two men do have information to add and uh, you know, information that the commissioner would want to hear. Now, um, the Ball government has set aside in the recent budget uh, more than $33 million for this inquiry. Justice LeBlanc uh, has said since then, uh, that's not what he asked for. Can you give us a sense of the cost of this inquiry? I can certainly tell you that Justice Lamont is very concerned about you know keeping the, the cost of this inquiry as low as we reasonably can. Obviously, we have a job to do, and we need to make sure we do a good job. Uh, he has come out and said, as you might know, he put out a press release to say that uh, his ask to government in terms of his budget was a lot less than than what actually appeared in the provincial government. Uh, in the coming weeks, uh, we will be putting out some in more information to the public about the cost that we've spent to date, and looking forward at some of our anticipated costs. There were a number of people who lobbied, called for a forensic audit, and the commissioner did include that. Um, will the results of that audit be released before this inquiry is over, or is the expectation that the inquiry finishes, the audit will be released at the same time? No, the, the, uh, we have engaged, uh, Grant Thornton is the firm that we've engaged to do an investigative audit, an investigative forensic audit. The Grant Thornton will be providing a report, in fact, probably two reports, um, to the commissioner, and we expect that Grant Thornton representatives will be called at witnesses in, during the inquiry, and their reports will be uh, presented into evidence then. Okay, and the inquiry is due to wrap up December 2019. The commissioner's report has to be to the minister by December 2019. Okay. Kate O'Brien, lots to look forward to as this gets underway with public uh, hearings starting next fall, next September, I understand. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, Kate did say that the inquiry will have two phases. In September, uh, it's pre-sanction and the role of the PUB. Okay. Then coming up in February, they're going to look at the construction and possibly after that, phase three, a, a forward-looking policy phase. So this sounds a whole lot more complicated than we saw with the Dumphy inquiry where it was all focused on one day and uh, more, I guess, like the Cameron inquiry where you've got lots of different tentacles that you need to spread out for something like that this. That is so true. Uh, Kate O'Brien says their challenge and their objective uh, will be to make this as clear as possible to the public. Attention all athletes, Happy Valley Goose Bay is about to get a whole lot healthier. That story's coming up.
Welcome back, everyone. Before we start talking about the slipping and sliding that you're forecasting, what about that ice in Las Vegas? Ah, nice segue. <laughs> Brad Gushu's Team Canada now sits at 6-1 and one this morning. Uh, they defeated one of their tougher rivals, Norway, by a score of 8-2. to two. Yeah, last night they won by an even bigger margin when they took on Japan. The score was 9-2, to two, and they did it in only six ends. The ice is, uh, or the team is on the ice again this evening, competing against the Netherlands, which is sitting in 11th place with a record of one and five. Yeah, good luck to them. Yeah, for all the chatter about them being not quite on their game, that's a pretty impressive record so far. Yeah, they're, they have hit their stride, I think, yeah. but the beginning of the tournament, they were a bit off. So, Ryan, tomorrow morning, are we going to have to be, you know, getting out the brooms and hurrying hard <laughs> as we uh, slide down the sidewalks? That's a good question. And uh, by the looks of the timing, I think the ice is certainly going to be melting by the time we hit those walkways and head out to the driveways. I think still, still some scraping to do, but temperatures are going to shoot up pretty quickly between that 3 a.m. and 9 a.m. time frame. So depending on exactly when you head to work will uh, depend on how much scraping you have to do. The freezing rain warnings are in effect for the Avalon, the Buren. Uh, basically that southeast half of the island, you can see where in the central regions it's a special weather statement in effect with the snow and the freezing rain combination. And freezing rain warnings also in effect for the northern peninsula. Rainfall warnings for Burgio to Ramia. Blowing snow advisories for the Straits, Nain, as well as Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and Eagle River. And snowfall warnings in effect for Churchill Falls and Churchill Valley. That looks to be the bullseye. And the best chance of seeing amounts over 15 centimeters will be across the interior parts of Labrador. Uh, 10 to as much as 15 for Happy Valley Goose Bay towards Labrador City. 5 to 10 centimeters for a good portion of the southeast, including Cartwright. And most of Newfoundland will be in that 5 to 10 centimeter range. Bet best chance of 10 centimeters will be over the higher elevations of the southwest and up in the long range of mountains and those higher elevations of the west coast. Look at the satellite and radar. This is a pretty impressive system for this time of year. In the Maritimes right now, we have snow, ice pellets, freezing rain, rain and thunderstorms as far north as Sydney, Nova Scotia right now in Cape Breton. So and thunderstorms across Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick right now. So uh, lots of uh, cold air and warm air doing battle here. This is a pretty uh, potent low that is on its way in. Hence the wreck house wind warning, which is also in effect uh, as we uh, roll through the next couple of hours now. Watch your timeline here by 11 p.m. Certainly into the snow across from St. John's through Central to Cornerbrook. The pink here is the ice pellets that you'll hear tap, 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 tap on the windows as we roll through the late evening into the overnight hours by 2, 3 a.m. That's when we're starting to see, I think, that freezing rain starting to mix in as temperatures near the freezing mark. Again, from St. John's to Cornerbrook, uh, the snow really starting to ramp up now for the northern peninsula. By tomorrow morning, temperatures, as I said, will be shooting above zero pretty quickly once we do rise above zero. Uh, temperatures will really uh, start to rise by 6, 7 a.m. Uh, this is what I'm thinking in terms of temperatures. Four degrees in metro at least, uh, eight to seven degrees across the south coast. A little bit longer uh, hanging on will be those that colder air through central, especially towards the Humber Valley. Five in Cornerbrook, uh, still below zero for the northern peninsula and the Straits, and a very chilly start for you folks in Labrador with the snow on the doorstep. The snow uh, will be most uh, coming down steadiest right through the day on Thursday in Labrador, while in Newfoundland we see those periods of rain marching from west to east through the day, and we will see temperatures in the double digits and then falling for the west coast back down into the low single digits by the end of the day. Central Newfoundland starts to slide into the afternoon. St. John's, we're into the double digits for a good portion of tomorrow. In fact, uh, I think we should top out around 11 or 12 degrees for Metro. And from Gander, the northeast coast, down through the southern shore, chance of seeing some sun breaks in there, even through central Newfoundland as well, the southwest coast. Again, a bit of some wet flurry action mixing in for Cornerbrook after temperatures top out near 8 and then fall. Uh, some of those wet flakes mixing in by the end of the day. There's that messy mix in the southeast. Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, some snow right from start to finish tomorrow, as well as Labrador City with temperatures wrapping in from the north. Minus 14, a chilly one there. We'll walk you through Friday and the weekend. Guess what? More systems on the way. The details are coming up. Debbie? 
Thanks, I think, Ryan. <laughs> well, it's a project years in the making, a new wellness center for Happy Valley Goose Bay. After today's government announcement, shovels could be breaking ground by summer. Here now's Jacob Barker has more. Well, this is the spot. This is where the new wellness center is supposed to be built, sandwiched in between a Tim Hortons restaurant and a newly built private gym facility. But it's going to take big money to get it done about $25 million. Officials from provincial, federal and municipal governments came together today, each spelling out their commitment to the project. There's a multi-purpose gymnasium, there's an aquatic centre with a swimming pool. Also included, and this is something that I heard loud and clear, you know, coming to Happy Valley Goose Bay is a need for more child care services. The town, which is on the hook for about $6 million, still has some fundraising to do. Whoever wants to make a contribution, I mean, the YMCA, you know, will be operating this facility. And if you visit the YMCA and other areas, they have corporate, uh, corporate sponsorships. And we intend to follow that model. A request for proposals to design and construct the building still has to go out but the town is confident construction will begin very soon. We intend hopefully break ground this summer and uh, by uh, early 2020 we'll have a brand new uh, state-of-the-art uh, wellness recreation facility in our community. And that's got many people excited. This facility we have right now isn't quite the proper length for swimming, right? So uh, since it's not the proper length we have to do extra laps to uh, sort of catch up to the proper length. With the new 25 meter pool, hopefully we'll be able to make up for that and actually get proper training in. And if that timeline holds up, we could see a new wellness center appear here in the next two years or so. And that would be a long awaited day for many here in the community. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, welcome news. Absolutely. It's one of those things you don't think about a lot, but you know, up until recently, the Gym on the base was basically the only proper gym in the community, and so a lot of people have struggled for years with, you know, how do I work out, how do I stay healthy, mm -hmm. so especially uh, with the province where we're trying to get everyone to get fit and, uh, you know, hopefully this will be something that helps a bit. I don't think success is totally defined by forming a government. There are 500,000 people. We need to look at electoral reform. The two candidates running to lead the NDP square off in our studio.
Well, it's down to just a few final days. On Sunday, the NDP in this province will choose a new leader. We know it's going to be a woman, but just who's it going to be? Well, it's going to be one of these two. Jerry Rogers is one of the candidates. She's currently in MHA. And also running, Alison Coffin, who is an economist and head of the Faculty Association at MUN right now. Thank you very much, both of you, for coming in. Thank Great you. to be here, Peter. So now, the NDP has struggled to grow beyond being a St. John's-based party. I want each of you to give me one thing that you think the party needs to change in order to broaden its appeal. Ms. Coffin, let's start with you. Well, I think we do need to have very firm roots in rural uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. We already have some very nice pockets of uh, NDP uh, through the West Coast, out on the Bjorn Peninsula. So I think we can build on those, starting with uh, regional district associations and then identifying very strong candidates in each of our 40 districts. Ms. Rogers, it's been something that, you know, building that infrastructure outside of St. John's has been a priority for the party, but we haven't seen much action under the leadership of Mr. McCurdy. What do you think the party needs to do to expand? We have to be really connected to people all over the province, and we, ha and we do that by engaging with people. We do that by talking about issues that are really relevant to people's lives. There's a lot of mythology out there about who the NDP is and what we stand for. And I believe when we do, I've got a lot of contacts. I've built a whole network of people all over the province. And it's when we start talking about the issues that are relevant to people's lives, when we start talking about what is it that's keeping you alive, uh, awake at night, that kind of of engagement is so important because politics really is about relationships and trust and so it's about using also we have to use every technology at our at our disposal to do Facebook live to do all kinds of um, social media to to be engaged with people around the province and also as a leader as a leader to spend a lot of time outside of St. John's to be connected in Labrador on the south coast in uh, Bergio all across the province and I, that is possible and that what is really what needs to be done. When Mr. McCurdy stepped down one of the challenges that he talked about was the fact he didn't have a seat in the legislature as leader. Ms. Coffin, if you win you're not going to have a seat so okay. how are you going to manage to try and engage with the population when you're not going to be there in question period? You're not going to be asking questions to the Premier. No, I won't be doing that, not yet. I will eventually, but I will be able to do an enormous amount of research and be able to feed my colleagues, both Jerry and Lorraine, excellent questions that they can bring to the House. I've also eyed several districts that could potentially be up for by-election, uh, so I'm getting prepared for that as well. Would you run in the first available seat that came up for a by-election? Uh, if that seemed viable, absolutely I would consider that, but it would have to be very well balanced, of course. Now, you did run in the last provincial I election, did. but you didn't win a seat, so mm -hmm. what makes you think it would be different this time if you uh, won and had to run for a seat again? Well, I imagine that uh, the district, uh, depending on what the district was, of course, I imagine it would be slightly different than the circumstances I faced before. We were facing a, a number of uphill battles, and the, the district that I had chosen was one that had been, uh, already had an incumbent who took the seat over from his mother, who took the seat over from his father. So there had been a long history there, so it was a, quite a difficult seat to win by the time I entered the race. Ms. Rogers, you've had seven years as an MHA. A lot of people see you as one of the main faces because you're one of the two MHAs. Is a vote for you essentially a vote for the status quo of what the party has been for the last few years? Absolutely not. I think that I've brought, what I've brought to the table is doing politics in a very different way. And we're 500,000 people in this province with some very significant challenges. And again, politics is about relationships, it's about trust, and I have managed to work well with the other parties. I've had three private members motions and all all three of them passed unanimously and they were about uh, really important issues. For instance, I w was responsible for starting the All-Party Committee on Mental Health and Addictions because it was about people's lives and, and, and it was such a crucial, crucial issue. But I've not been your regular kind of politician. I came, I came from a whole background of community activism and community involvement as, as a filmmaker and also in the other kind of activism work that I've done. So I've been building coalitions. I've been reaching out beyond sort of your traditional politics and that's what politics should be about. It's about those relationships. It's about trust. Um, there are ideas that I have for the party that are very different than the status quo for the party and I'm not a status quo kind of person. 
I, I want to ask you about what success looks like for the NDP. You mentioned things like the private members' resolutions, the All-Party Committee on Mental Health was something that came out of the NDP. Does the NDP need to form a government in order to be successful, or do you think the party can essentially continue with that, the phrase that we often hear, small and mighty caucus, with you know a smaller number of MHAs, but still pushing to get things done? Ms. Coffin? Um, I don't think success is totally defined by forming a government, although that would be the ultimate success, and that's what I'm aiming for. However, building our party, the number of seats, building district associations, helping to change a lot of the preconceived notions of what the New Democratic Party represents, and giving a better idea of we are about social policy, but we're also about economic policy as well, and we can do both of those together. And I think success for us is being able to make a real inroads and and affect policy as it affects the people of the province. The best way to do that is to be government. And I believe that the people of Newfoundland and Labrador are waiting for us. They're waiting for the NDP to prove that we can do this. And that's our task now. I think th they're waiting for us and uh, we have to step up to the plate and show that we are a viable alternative. We're not way out here uh, 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 out in the field, but actually that we are ready. We are ready to be able to do the work that needs to be done to help re-guide our province back into a time of prosperity. Our, our, our challenge now is to prove to the people of the province that we can do that. Well, good luck to both of you. Thank One of you. you are going to become leader on Sunday, and uh, we'll all be watching closely. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Well, here's a shot of beautiful St. John's Harbor. You can see pretty cloudy. Doesn't look like there's any flakes coming out just yet, but boy, it's uh, getting awfully close. And a look at the parkway here outside the CBC. And again, pretty cloudy skies. The flakes are on the doorstep, and it's going to be a messy old mix tonight. And there's more unsettled weather in the long range. We'll break down your forecast after the break. Time now to meet our Young Athlete of the Day. 
We'd like to introduce you now to Katie Faulo. Katie is seven years old and comes to us from Port Rexton. She is dedicated to gymnastics and takes part in the program at Velocity in Clarenville. Way to go, Katie. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. Well, I said I wasn't uh, sure if I really wanted to hear any more, but yeah, of course don't. it's important. <laughs> you don't. Uh, yeah, we're uh, tight on time and heavy on weather, so uh, let's get right to it with our uh, snowfall forecast for the next 24 to 36 hours. And again, 5 to 10 across most of the island tonight. Uh, more in Labrador, the heaviest amounts over Churchill Falls and Churchill Valley. Some warm air coming with this though, and so that 5 to 10 will take a pretty good cut across most of Newfoundland. You can see 10 degrees in Halifax already. That is the air mass that's on its way, and this is the system. You can see snow starting to push in across the island, but that rain has pushed up now across most of the Maritimes. This forecast model doing a pretty good job on the timing. By tomorrow morning, we have transitioned to rain from St. John's to Corner Brook fairly early in the morning and likely still a little bit of scraping to do uh, for you early morning risers, but certainly by mid morning that warm air and the rain will have uh, melted a lot of the ice and then the snow will take a cut as I said into the afternoon, some double digit temps, even some sunshine breaking through over central and eastern Newfoundland later in the day. And we are talking about the mix back to some onshore flurries and temperatures falling along the west coast. It's a much cooler Friday setting up across most of the region as the snow clears in Labrador and then our next system pushes in for Friday night in through Saturday. And if you have some travel plans on Saturday, we will be looking at snow in the morning, eastern, central, western Newfoundland. It looks like a mix to rain into the afternoon for eastern Newfoundland, possibly a mix back to snow for Saturday evening into the overnight, though that is a little more uncertain and it may be just a wet snow. So here's how things are going to play out over the next three days. You can see those double digit temps tomorrow. Uh, temperatures falling in the west. That snow ramps up in Labrador. The snow tapers off in Labrador on Friday. Look at the cooler temperatures setting up for Friday. Minus two to minus five for eastern to set uh, western to uh, eastern Newfoundland rather Saturday. Temperatures near the freezing mark, but I do think we hang on to the snow uh, in terms of uh, not much in the way of mixing for central uh, and especially west, but some mixing, as I said, for the Avalon and the Buren Peninsula is an interesting setup here as we roll into the Saturday evening time period. There's that potential mix back to some snow for Saturday night into Sunday morning. Our next system, so this is, would be system number three now, moves in. It appears through that Saturday night into Sunday time period right now. I'm thinking that it's going to be mixing back to rain for Sunday night. At least that's what the latest guidance is uh, pointing to. And I think that's a pretty good idea based on this track anyway uh, for the Sunday night into Monday time period. So back over from another snow mix to rain. Central and west, not so much. And if this model is projecting things correctly, could be a little bit of snow to shovel in your forecast. Certainly as we roll into the latter half of the weekend and even the early part of the weekend as well. So uh, we're not out of the woods just yet. There is your forecast uh, again, uh, quite unsettled right across the region. Lots of mixing in the east, not so much for central and west and into Labrador much quieter after we get rid of the snow here uh, as it tapers off on Friday. That's your forecast to now, Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Facebook confirmed today what many Canadians already feared, that more than 600,000 Canadians may have had their data shared with a consulting company. The disclosure comes in the wake of one of the biggest data privacy scandals in the history of the social networking website. An academic researcher had collected information from more than 50 million Facebook users and shared that information with the British company Cambridge Analytica. It's believed the personal information was used for political purposes. To Toronto now, where as many as 50 vehicles are involved in a massive highway accident. It happened late this afternoon on Highway 400 near Barrie. There are no serious injuries, thankfully, and it appears the pileup was caused by weather. Beautiful picture here, and this one was taken along the north coast of the island. The, and I'll even give you this tip, uh, the Bay of Exploits is uh, where this picture was snapped. If you can name the location, even the island, there's another big clue. <laughs> it is beautiful. I haven't got a clue, speaking <laughs> of clues. This is a tough one. <laughs> we'll reveal where this was taken after the break.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, he was already the top scorer in Europe's top soccer club competition. Yeah, but this goal yesterday by Cristiano Ronaldo was extra special. Carvajal, Ronaldo! It came in the 64th minute of the Champions League quarterfinal. The Real Madrid star leaped into the air, delivered a mighty bicycle kick, sending that ball whipping past the keeper. Yeah, Real Madrid won the game 3-0, and Ronaldo became the first player in Champions League history to score in 10 straight matches. Wow. He's going down in history, isn't he? Absolutely. <laughs> Extremely high winds in the Toronto area left about 100,000 customers without power at one point today. Yeah, the storm affected much of southern Ontario with winds measured at more than 90 kilometers an hour. Aw, they think that's a storm. That's, that's <laughs> cute. One construction crane partially collapsed from the heavy gusts just west of Toronto and Mississauga. No one was injured. Hydro officials say there are many reports of downed trees and power lines throughout the area. Same storm that's on its way in here as we speak. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, our viewer picture of the day from Fogel Island ah. and a beautiful picture, a beautiful sunset. And it was uh, courtesy of Cindy who snapped this at Brimstone Head Park. Oh, I've heard of it. I haven't had the pleasure. I've spent four hours on Fogo Island working, you know, with CBC and that's yeah. all they gave me. Four hours. It I gotta go back. More time, yes. <laughs> Thanks so much See for watching. See you tomorrow. Good night. Have a great day.